سلامتي فالهمها فجورها وتقواها قد افلح من زكاها وقد خاب من دساها كذبت ثمود بطغواها اذ بعث اشقاها فقال لهم رسول الله ناقة الله وسقياها فكذبوه فعقروها فدمدم عليهم ربهم بذنبهم فسواها ولا يخاف عقباها الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin our study today إن شاء الله تعالى of Surah Al-Shams which follows Surah Al-Balad In the previous surah we learned uh, many things but a few things that I'd like to reiterate were certain conflicts that were highlighted in the previous surah One of them was the conflict between the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the people and really it's the conflict that the people initiated in which in the beginning of the surah we learned وَأَنْتَ حِلٌّ بِهَذَا الْبَلَدِ that you have been made pretty much halal, permissible meaning the attack against you or to expel you from the city which was one of the meanings of وَأَنْتَ حِلٌّ بِهَذَا الْبَلَدِ that is now the case or it's about to be the case that they're going to have a conflict against you and even at the end of the same surah وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِنَا and those who disbelieve in our miraculous signs where are the ayat coming from? they're coming from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu so kufr in the ayat is an indirect reference also to kufr in the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and all of this is one package if you will it's ar-risala so when Allah azza wa jal talks about the books the angels and the prophets it's really one thing it's the message because the message is delivered by the angels to the messenger and what does he deliver? the book it's one thing so when we say for example man amana billahi wal malaika wal kitab wal nabiyyin it's really one thing so this is the conflict between the people and ar-risala the second conflict that was illustrated in the previous surah was the conflict that every single human being suffers from and there's no escape from, which is the struggle of day-to-day living. And that was captured in the words, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Another conflict that was mentioned was the conflict the, hu- the arrogant human being has against Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. That was captured in the words, أَيَحْسَبُ أَلَّنْ يَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ أَحَدْ أَيَحْسَبُ أَلَّمْ يَرَهُ أَحَدْ Does he assume that no one has control over him? Does he assume nobody saw him? Right? Those words were illustrating a conflict between him and Allah Azza wa Jal. Another conflict between the disbeliever or the one that refuses to take the right path and against those who need help in human- humanity. So for him, he's not even is not only is he not a believer, he's not even a humanitarian. So when Allah talked about falaktaham al aqaba, that he refused to climb that upward climb that was tougher than the other side, then Allah explained what that aqaba was, and it was all humanitarian causes. So rather. So all of those were causes that you know, in in order to help humanity around him, not even in interested in that so there's a conflict between him and those who are in need so after all of these conflicts that are illustrated there were some internal realities that Allah Azza wa alluded to in the previous surah and the central ayah you could even say is وَهَدَيْنَاهُ najdain. We guided him, Allah says, we guided him to two paths, two paths that are heading upwards. And that was really the center of the previous surah. This surah, you could think of it as a tafsir, as an explanation of that one statement. Those two pathways that Allah alluded to and talked about the higher path and how you have to be a giving human being, that is now going to be opened up in further detail and we're going to get a real insight into the Qur'an and the, the, the Islamic view of human psychology and human personality. This is the term that we're going to be looking at the word nafs, which really problematic a problematic translation of nafs is soul because it leads to some other implications in English literature. Um, another, I think, oversimplification even is person. A word that may come close to it doesn't capture all of its meanings, but comes close to it is conscience. 
the English word conscience is kind of close to the idea of nafs as is expressed in the Quran and Sunnah but we'll see a discussion of the nafs in this surah inshallah ta'ala in full bloom and how we're supposed to reflect on this marvelous creation of Allah when we read the ayat wa nafsin wa ma sawaha we're coming to those ayat inshallah ta'ala today so we begin inshallah ta'ala with the the first ayah wa shamsi wa duhaha this is a surah of oaths uh, we've seen a number of surahs so far that begin with Allah's declaration of oaths there's one opinion about about the oath that I did not share that was held by a, a minority of scholars yet it is still there that every time Allah takes an oath by any of his creations there's hadf of a mudaf meaning there's a word that hasn't been said that is understood and that is the word rabb so when he says washamsi they understand this as warabb shamsi by the lord of the sun so for example when he says wal asr what he means is warabb al asr by the i swear by the master the lord of time etc so that's another opinion that I I didn't share with you in the past but that has existed in, in, in our tradition but for the most part that has not been taken for the most part we look at these oaths in and of themselves and the sunnah is that when we take an oath we take it by Allah but when Allah has, takes the oath He has the right to take it by whatever He wills okay so Allah Azza wa Jal swears by the sun was shamsi but then He adds waduhaha and I, I swear by the sun and by its soothing morning light the definition of duha is two things. It, some have called it dawu shams also, the light of the sun. Others have called it the entire day. But the majority opinion comes from the linguistic analysis of it. Like Ibn Abbas, for example, says, "Well, muradu ida ashraqat wa qama sultanuha," meaning when the sun comes completely out, and it's not, you know, it's not early, early morning where it's not completely manifest, but it's out so you can see the sun. And but it's not difficult for you to look at the sun either. It's the soothing time of sunlight. It's not the scorching sun, it's the soothing sun. Now interestingly, I want, I'm not going to explain it fully, but I want uh, food for thought as we continue inshallah. Allah did not just swear by the sun that has that property. He took two distinct oaths. He doesn't say, for example, وَالشَّمْسِ الضَّاحِيَةِ The brilliant sun. I swear by the soothing sun. He didn't say that. He said, I swear by the sun and separately, وَبُحَاهَا Another oath, that I swear by its morning light. And I swear by that t- uh, its, its ability to give that morning light. So two aspects, the sun itself and one of its contributions. You could think of it like that. You could think of al-duhaha as one of its contributions. أَيْ ضَوْءُهَا وَإِشْرَاقُهَا When explaining duhaha, uh, Mujahid says, أَيْ ضَوْءُهَا وَإِشْرَاقُهَا Its light and its morning of ishraq. وَأَضَافَ الضُحَى إِلَى الشَّمْسِ لِأَنَّهُ إِنَّمَا يَكُونُ عِنْدَ ارْتِفَاعِهَا he says that this was attributed with the sun because it only happens due to the sun. The word duha, that light, is not attributed to any other kind of uh, source of light. Like you can't use duha for a torch or a lamp or anything like that. It's an exclusive feature of the sun. وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا And I swear by the moon, you could say in simple English, إِذَا تَلَاهَا The word tala in Arabic has two origins. It's tala yatlu tilawatan and tala yatlu tilwan. And tala yatlu tilawatan means to read. And talayatlu tilwan means to follow along, follow right behind something. So, wal qamari idha talaha and the moon as it follows it and continues to follow it. There's repetition, takrar in the word tala also. So, the, Allah swears by the moon as it follows it. Now, what does it follow? What is that it? It is the sun. The ha referring to the sun. Now, notice in the previous oath, there were two features. And there was a wa separating them. That was the sun itself and its soothing light. Its ability to produce that soothing light. The second oath is one thing, the moon itself, and it's not given a unique entity, it's given this subservient position, إِذَا talaha. I swear by the moon as it follows the sun. Some ulama commented these are the first 15 days of the month, and other opinions have also been uh, given about the implications of إِذَا talaha. But we'll go to some straight, uh, straightforward and uh, very direct implications of this statement of Allah Azza wa Jal. Number one, as a Shawkani comments, as Ujaj also says, Talaha hina stadar, meaning it follows the sun, especially when it becomes full, meaning it's a fully circular moon. That's the time when you could see that it's really following the sun. And what do they mean by following the sun? فَكَانَ يَتْلُ الشَّمْسَ فِي الضِّيَاءِ وَالنُّورِ يَعْنِي إِذَا كَمِلَ ضَوْءُهُ فَصَارَ تَابِعًا لِلشَّمْسِ That when its light becomes complete, it is following the sun. In other words, it's reflecting the light off of the sun. This is even an opinion among our salaf. فِي الْإِنَارَةِ وَقَالَ الْفَرَّاءِ الْفَرَّاءِ also says تَلَاهَا أَيْ أَخَذَ مِنْهَا that it ta- When Allah says the moon follows it, it means he take, it takes from it. Now how does he explain takes from it? أَنَّ الْقَمَرَ يَأْخُذُ مِنْ ضَوْءِ الشَّمْسِ 
that the moon takes from the light of the sun. So that even the Salaf understood it in this way, that the moon draws from the light of the sun. So obviously it's in a subservient position, position to the sun. So now again, just food for thought, we're not going to go any further into this, but Allah swears by the sun and its contribution of duha, one of the most beautiful times of day. And then He swears by the moon in its subservient position to the sun, and it follows it, meaning it takes from its light. And it follows along, and also, also Allah Azza wa Jal, when He talks about day and night, He mentions day first. So he says, for example, in Surah Yasin, لَا الشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُدْرِكَ الْقَمَرُ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارُ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ So he says, it's not becoming of the sun that it may proceed, or it may come after the moon, and nor will night precede the day. So the sequence that Allah defines in the Qur'an is day first, night second. That's the sequence Allah Azza wa Jalla defined. Anyhow, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّهَا And I swear by the day as it gives brilliance to it. Now this is a, a tough thing to explain. The word jalla, to give brilliance, to give something that's already bright, an exposure. Meaning for example, you have a lamp, but it's covered up. So you have no opportunity to appreciate that it gives light. So if you do jall, if you do tajalli to it, or, or tajliya actually, that's, that would be the mustar, then you're giving it an opportunity to show its full glory. And actually, tajalla is used as an Arabic verb for you know, a wife when she beautifies herself for the husband. She's fully showing her full glory to her husband. That's how it was used in classical Arabic pre-Islamic. So now when we say, وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّهَا It's an interesting metaphor, and, and uh, really it's sort of a, an indirect form of speech that makes you think, it's a lot of allegory in the speech. Allah says, and the day which gives the opportunity to the sun, at the time that it gives the opportunity to the sun to show its full glory. The word ha referring to the sun. Meaning Allah is talking about the day as though it's giving the sun a chance to show its glory. It's like in a supporting position. Though literally what we mean is, the, the sun is what causes the day to happen. But here Allah is saying, no, the day is giving the sun a chance to bright, to show up. What Allah is illustrating here is Allah created these opportunities for that brilliant thing that Allah created the sun to be appreciated. If Allah did not create the, you know, produce the creation of the day, there would be no appreciation of the brilliance of the sun. So, وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّهَا Another opinion on the, the pronoun ha in jallaha has been that it's the earth. Meaning, I swear by the morning, as the, as the, the, the morning gives brilliance to the day. Gives brilliance to the day. That's a weaker opinion because Jalla is usually used for something that has light in and of itself. And we know the earth does not have light in and of itself. So really the stronger opinion is that the ha refers back to the sun. And one last oath about the creation of night and day. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا And I swear by the night as it covers it up. As it covers what up? Really it's the day. The ha is feminine. So it's not referring to the day, it's referring to the sun. As the, I swear by the night as it covers up the light of the sun, as it covers the sun up, okay? So all of these oaths so far actually center around the sun. They center around the sun. The central theme is the sun itself. First it was the sun directly, literally. Then it was the moon, but it wasn't even given credit itself. It was given an association with the moon. Then, uh, with the sun rather. Then the day, which is in a supporting role of having people appreciate the sun. And finally the night that makes an attempt to cover up the sun. So everything has been about the sun. Okay? And we're going to see soon a parallel in isti'ara in this surah. The parallel is being drawn between the sun and the nafs. The parallel is between the sun, the creation of the sun, this brilliant creation, and also the nafs. And how the sun has these different roles and different you know, things happening to it, just like the nafs has different things happening to it. Subhanallah. Then he says, وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا And I swear by the sky, and I'll translate it two ways. And I swear by the sky, and I, I swear by what made it. I swear by what made it. Now of course, who made the sky? It is Allah. So you would expect, who made it? But the wording here is, what made it? This would be called ma al mausula in Arabic. Okay, if you interpret, some mufassirun has, have interpreted this ma as ma al mausula, And then the translation for us would be, I swear by the sky, and I swear by what made it. What referring to Allah. Which seems kind of inappropriate, right? Because you would use man banaha. But you have to understand this in a little bit deeper sense. You know, you, know, you say for someone you don't know, you say, who is he? Right? You say, who is he? But sometimes you also say, what is he? 
When do you say what is he? You say, oh, he's an engineer. Right? When you say, when you say who is he, you might find out his name. But when you say what is he, what do you find out? His attributes. His attributes. Okay? So when you ask the question, and who and what can be referring to a dhul aql, meaning a, a creature that possesses intellect even like human beings. But of course, it can also refer to Allah Azza wa Jal. So when we say man banaha, the question is who created it? And the, the answer is Allah. But when you say ma banaha, the question is what kind of power can do that? The question, the what here is, what attributes does this being have that can create this? So the what is also actually very appropriate for Allah in this case. What, what's being done here is the human being is asked to imagine, stare at the sky and just exhaust your imagination into thinking, what kind of power must he be? And so I'm putting it in English in this way, what kind of power must he be? And that's what's being illustrated, وَمَا بَنَاهَا But there's another interpretation of the same ma, that what that we just translated, as in Arabic grammar it's called ma masdariya. So there's ma al mausula and ma al masdariya. There are two kinds of interpretations linguistically or grammatically. If you interpret this as ma al masdariya, then the meaning of wa ma banaha is and how remarkable its creation. It becomes an infinitive form of statement. That's why the word masdariya is used. So I swear by the sky and I swear by how remarkable its creation is or its construction is. Now by using the word bana, we are already learning it hasn't it wasn't always there. It's been constructed, right? Similarly, if you look at the, 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 the words that were used before, well, qamari idha tala. Tala means to start following. And when there's a verb, there's a beginning. So where did it begin? Where did, when did it start following? Similarly, when nahari idha jalla, jalla is also a verb. And every time you mention a verb, there's a beginning. So when did this all begin? Or who, who started it? Those questions are created by using these verbal forms and by the night as it covers it. And it covers it, in other words, this covering must have had a beginning. A verb, by definition, has a beginning. So now in all of these, when verbs are used instead of adjectives, instead of just saying the covering night, that would be an adjective. But the night as it covers, or when it covers, a verb has been used, it's created a question of when did this all begin, or who began it. And so Allah took it back to the more fundamental question, what kind of power constructed this, this sky? وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا and then finally, the last of these oaths in this crea- the, the, the series of creations is وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا But before we go to it, a little bit more about the word bina or binaya in Arabic. Uh, Ibn al-Faris, uh, rahimahullah, he says, بِنَاءُ الشَّيْءِ بِضَمِّي بَعْضِهِ إِلَىٰ بَعْضٍ That construction of something or bina in Arabic means to fuse something together or put some things together in a way that they get fused with each other and become inseparable. And this is actually an illustration of the Flawless, beautiful view of the sky, which in other places in the Quran is said in the way "Hal tara min futur." Do you see any cracks or any flaw? You know, even in the newest construction, you see some gap, something that that was missed, something that needs to be patched up. Do you see anything that needs patchwork in the sky? So, what a remarkable construction this is, without any flaw. Similarly, Allah says in another surah, "Was sama'a banaynaha bi aydin wa inna la musi'un." That it is the sky that we ourselves constructed and we are the ones giving it expansion. So the final oath in this series, وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا And I swear by the earth, and what, the, again, ma could be masdariya or what was the other word? Mausula. Ma could be masdariya or mausula. So if it's mausula, let's take it the same way we took the previous oath. If, if ma is ma al mausula, what ma al mausula here means is, and I swear by the earth, and what kind of power it must be that gave it its spread? Tahaha. Taha means to spread out and to lay down. So what kind of power must, be, must it be that laid down this earth and its vastness? Then if you say wa tahaha, the ma referring to ma al masdariya, it means how incredible its vastness, how incredible its laying down. So one is making the human, the one part of the translation or one in, implication is making the human being wonder about the remarkable powers or the attributes of Allah and the other, the remarkable creation itself. So on the one hand, you're reflecting on Allah Azza wa on the other, reflecting on His incredible creation. Both are captured in the words, مَا طَحَاهَا Another word that, this is by the way, this word is only used once in the Qur'an and this is it. And a sister word to it is دَحَا وَالْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ Dahaha. And according to most, like Nisal al Arab and, and Taj al Arus, they say that these words are actually the same word, but they were used by different tribes of the Arabs. And so, so the message is kind of universal in that both words are used in the Quran and both are used only once. Subhanallah. 
Paha is also used when the Arab would go to a castle or to a huge, huge, huge house where they almost couldn't see the end of where, how far it goes in. You know, you go to, go to somebody's house and there's a room leads to another room, leads to another room, and you're kind of wondering how far does it go? How far down is it laid out? Then they would, the attribute they would have for that is Mathiyah. Mathiyah, the Arab would say, that this house is well spread out. And that's the same word Allah uses for the earth. Now let's going back a l- just a little bit. These illustrations that Allah has given, first was the sun, everything centered around the sun. But really night and day was the, the, the larger theme. The sun, the moon, the day, the night. That was the sequence of the oaths that we just read. Allah Azza wa Jal asks us to reflect upon them before we prepare ourselves for the rest of the surah. Why? Because that is the function of the oaths. The oaths are an invitation to reflection. That's what they are. So we are asked to reflect on these creations and just some aspects of that reflection. First and foremost, these things are in conflict, right? The sun is, is, is in conflict with the moon. The day is in conflict with the night. But they're part of a larger picture. And all, as opposite as these things are, the experience of the human being, especially in the desert, now if you, know, if you stay indoors the whole day, you don't feel when it was day, when it was night. You could not even realize. If for example, you're in an office building with no windows, you won't know when it's day, when it's night. But for the person living in the desert, they have a very different experience in the day and a completely different experience at night. They're completely different worlds, right? So they see this completely op- these completely opposite things. But what we're learning here is Allah has given each of them a limit. They have a, you know, they have a certain time. There's a certain time for the sun and it's duha and it's, it's soothing morning. And there's a time for night as it follows the sun. And they're not going to break that order like we learned in Surah Yasin. لَشَّمْسُ يَنْبَغِي لَهَا أَن تُضْرِكَ الْقَمَرِ وَلَا اللَّيْلُ سَابِقُ النَّهَارِ So these opposites are there, but they don't break their rules. They've, given, they've been given rules and they follow them. They submit to this, this principle. And that following and that system and that discipline creates harmony for us. Now imagine for a moment if that's, that harmony disappeared. If the sun and the moon went their own ways and they, did, they rebelled. The, the word in Arabic is طُغْيَان it's also used for water. You know when water stays in the ocean, but if it comes out and spills over and there's a flood, taghal ma, the water rebelled. Right? So imagine if the sun and the moon, they rebelled, who would suffer the consequences? There would be chaos on the earth. So we're talking about things in the sky, but if things went haywire, where would the consequences be? On the earth, on us. We're about to learn later on, there's also these conflicts, these opposites inside the human being. And just like Allah balanced and perfected and gave discipline and limits to each side, inside the human being there are also different inclinations and Allah balanced all, all of them. When we read the ayah, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا So now coming back to this idea of, of uh, harmony between all of these creations, first Allah mentioned things to notice in the sky, of course a different sky at day, a different sky at night. But when you reflect on this harmony, you say these are such opposite things. What kind of power must it be, number one, to create such an enormous creation like the sun, or the moon, or their brilliance? But more importantly, what kind of enormous creation or incredible, incredible creator must it be rather, that gave them harmony? Despite them being such opposites, he gave them harmony. So this is the, the, the point of reflection that's been set for us before we continue into the rest of the surah. And what to think of just the sky, the same creator... How incredibly well he caused balance and harmony on the earth, how it spread out, how it spread all over, subhanAllah. So now, we come to an oath now that is almost a departure from everything we've read before, which is the ayah, wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. Allah swears by the nafs, and you notice there's no alif lam on it. Washams, wal qamar, wal layl, wal nahar, wal layl. Alif lam, alif lam, alif lam, alif lam. Everything Allah took an oath by had an alif lam. But now he's taking an oath by the nafs, but there's no alif lam. He doesn't say, one nafsi wa ma sawaha. He says, one nafsin wa ma sawaha. And at tankir lit tafkhim. Okay, or lit ta'zim. That the nakira here, or the lack of alif lam here, is to magnify that above all of this, the point of all of this reflection is reaching its climax when you think about the nafs. This surah is actually, a, you know, a lot of times my teacher used to say, uh, 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 he used to say that the, some ayat of the Qur'an are like seeds And some passages of the Qur'an are like flowers that came out of that seed right? So in one place in the Qur'an Allah Azza wa Jal says سَنُدِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ That we will soon show them our miraculous signs in the horizons And inside of their own selves 
fi anfusihim until it becomes absolutely clear to them that that is, that this is that it is the truth, right? Now that statement began by reflection on what? The horizons. And then what? The nafs. Look at this surah. That was the seed. And this is sort of the flower that comes out of that seed. The, the beginning ayat are asking us to reflect upon the, the horizons. And then we're coming to reflect upon the nafs. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا And the nafs, and the, again the conscience if you will, but really person and it has more to, you know, I say conscience with a disclaimer because the word conscience in English literature and our speech also is typically used not when you want to do something bad. But it's used either, you know, I have a clear conscience, which means I am, you know, I don't feel bad about anything I did. Or I have a guilty conscience, right? But you don't really use conscience when you want to do something bad, like I have an evil conscience. Actually, the word for that is you have no conscience. Right, the English literary term for that is you have no conscience at all. So it's a little bit difficult to translate sometimes these things word for word. But part of the nafs, the nafs al ammara and the nafs al nawama, at least the word conscience fits. And nafs al nafs al mutmainna also to some extent, al nafs al ammara actually doesn't fit. Al nafs al mutmainna and al lawama it fits. But the commanding nafs, the word conscience doesn't really fit. So we'll talk about that separately, inshaAllah ta'ala. Anyhow, wa nafsin wa masawaha, the word sawa comes from taswiya. And this has been used, we found this used in Juz Amma before. Just a few things. Sawa is to take things that are uneven. You know, you have a bunch of things that are uneven, and you organize them, and you balance them in a way that it evens out. If you had a scale, right, and you had some weight on this side, some weight on this side. Taswiya, sawa, would be that you balance them in a way that it's perfect. Equal weight on both sides. Okay, it's balanced. Taswiya also means to create something, like you know, you're constructing a building, or you're building some, some sort of tool or whatever. But you didn't just build it, you balanced it perfectly, and you did all the finishing touches. Down to the finest detail, it's perfect, it's symmetrical, etc. This is taswiya. Allah asks us to reflect, not only do I want you to reflect on the, on the nafs, the nafs itself, meaning yourself, your conscience, but in addition, how remarkably well it has been balanced. And how amazing is the one who balanced it? Ma could be mausul al masladiyah again. How remarkable its balance, and how remarkable the one who balanced it. What kind of attributes must he have, the one who balanced this? What's what you know? And this is actually a remarkable, remarkable lesson in the Quran. Our conscience is directly something that makes us remember Allah. And since Allah is the one who gave us our conscience, you know this, and its definition is coming very soon. We should realize that the one who gave us this conscience is watching what we do with it. So this conscience, you know, I feel good, I feel bad, I feel guilty, I, I, don't, I, sh- I think I should have done more, I, I, th- I don't think I should have done that, etc., etc. You say, you felt this. But Allah is teaching you, the one who programmed this into you watches what you're doing also. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا Profound reality about the nafs. When you think your, your inner thoughts, know that there's a designer for those inner thoughts. The one who gave you that ability to think in this fashion. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا Now what is that balance? You know balance is conflicting things being balanced together, left and right. In many many cultures there's this discussion of balance inside the self. The yin and the yang, for example. Right? Many civilizations talk about these two elements. You know, the, 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 the animal side and the spiritual side. And it's not just something on, in Islamic tradition, but Allah Azza wa gives us this really profound and deep understanding of this self. By the way, this is the heart of psychology studies. You know, in pre-modern society, there was a focus on philosophy. Right? So all these philosophies exist. And of course, philosophy talks about things that aren't, that, that aren't tangible, they're, they're abstract kinds of things. Right? And so you had tons and tons and tons of emphasis on philosophy and philosophical kinds of knowledge. Post-modern society and post-industrial post, you know, society, we became obsessed with science. And when you become obsessed with science, you're not concerned with things that are not tangible, you're only concerned with things that are tangible, that you can touch and feel and measure, right? So when philosophy used to talk about the soul and the conscience and guilt and all of these things philosophers have talked about for many, many, many you know, generations and even millennia, go to any philosophy, any philosophy from any civilization, they'll talk about these things. Soul, harmony, balance between you know, body and soul, good energy, bad energy, karma, all this foo-foo stuff you could call it, has always been there in philosophical discourse. But after the advent of modern society, the society in which we live, 
there was the shift towards science and tangible things and measurement, right? And because of this, we said, who needs the discussion on the soul? We don't, that's not scientifically measurable to see if a person has a soul or not, right? These aren't measurable quantities. So what did we do? We started studying the human being in scientific kinds of terms, right? And the beginning of that was a shift from philosophy to the new philosophy, which is psychology, right? The study of the human being used to be around philosophical studies, and now it's in what area? Psychological studies. And it, even psychology in its beginning was very philosophical in nature. Like, you know, if, you, if you've studied Freud, if, you've, if you were made to take a psychology 101 course, it's a lot of philosophy, his own philosophy on what the human being, you know, how he develops his emotions, what the personality is. And later on, there was a shift. There was a shift even in psychology studies and you know, the, the way we approach the human being, the study of the human being changed. One of the biggest mysteries in modern psychology studies, you know what it is? The definition of what is called personality. There is no set definition of one thing, personality. There is no definition. Every philosopher has their own definition. What is, that, what is the word for personality in the Qur'an? There are a few terms that make up personality in the Qur'an. There is the word ruh, which Allah Himself calls a mystery. He says, قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Tell them the ruh, I'm not even going to translate, is from the commandment of my Master, my Lord, and you have not been given from knowledge except very little. Meaning you're not going to know much about this thing inside of you, which is a part of you, which is ruh, you're even not going to know much. And today we're learning in psychology, we don't have a set definition of what a personality is. What is it? And then other terms that are used in the Qur'an that make up our personality is the word qalb, is the word nafs that is coming up here. These are really important terms, especially those of you that are interested and we have a desperate need for it in the Muslim community. You know, Muslim psychologists and therapists, family psychology, youth psychology, etc. Don't just study, you know, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis and medical biopsychology, etc. That's being taught in the university today, but also study psychology from the perspective of the Qur'an. So you have a real picture of, you know, the one who created knows better what he created. And we're just making theories about it. Just a couple more comments about that because it's an important subject of our times. Am I ever told you the shift towards science? So there was actually a shift to, and this is actually reversing now, but there was a major shift to reduce the human being to a bunch of chemicals. To explain everything that we do and say and feel to just a bunch of neurons firing in our head and a bunch of you know, uh, you know, hormones or chemicals that are released in our body. So because of that, that approach to psychology, this medical approach to psychology, what happened was, oh, are you feeling depressed? Take this pill. Do you feel guilty a lot? Take this pill. Right? Do you feel sad? Here's a pill for that too. Right? And you know, they'll, they'll run through the, um, the side effects, very, may, may make you suicidal, may make you kill your neighbor, etc., etc. They'll read that really, really fast and end the commercial. <laughs> right? But the idea is to reduce, to, to not acknowledge the existence of something more than just chemicals. Reduce the human being to just these bodily fluids and these electrical signals. That's it. That's all we are. Right? Because the, human, the effort now is to only look at what you can see and not look at what you cannot see. But this nafs is a mysterious thing. Allah gave it to us inside of us and it's not something physical. Right? The human being is made up of physical and you know, uh, intangible. Tangible and intangible. The ruh cannot be touched. Cannot be felt. You can't put it inside a jar. It's not something like that. It is from the Amr of Allah. The body is something physical. And you know the analogy that like Al-Biqa'i commented, Allah parallels the nafs with the body, just like He paralleled the sun with light. Because light, you know, you, you don't touch it. Right? But the sun is something tangible in and of itself. So he talks about these, these two things being fused together. Anyhow, so Allah says, وَنَفْسِ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا And how amazingly well He balanced it. Now of course, the balance is there's inclination towards good inside us and there's inclination towards evil inside us. The balance that's been talked about in other, uh, the ulama that talked about it at length, for example, Al-Alusi rahimahullah, says remarkable things on this subject. We the human beings, when Allah Azza wa Jal created us, when He created us, He created... The, the clay and he blew into it the ruh and the clay that he created the soil we, we were created from material that belongs to this earth you could call it organic matter nowadays right what are the things that we desire in this world all of them come from the earth right we desire companionship wealth food etc shelter all the things come from this earth 
we were created from this material and all of our needs and desires are also made of this material. Okay? But then there was something put inside of us that is not this material. Something was put inside of us that came from the Amr of Allah. The Ruh. The Ruh. It is not from this material. Now the body feels hungry and the food comes from where? The earth. Because the body is also from the earth. But then Allah put inside it a Ruh. But the Ruh is not from the earth. It came directly from Allah and it also feels hungry. And when the Ruh feels hungry, where does it food co- has to come from? What's the only food that will satisfy it? The only food that will satisfy it is that comes from revelation. Right? So this is a profound philosophical, if you will, reality of the human being. We're made of, of two things. And these two things are in conflict like night and day. These two things are in conflict like the sun and the moon. They're very different things. The body wants its own things and the ruh wants its own things. And they're pulling the human being in two opposite directions. They're pulling the human being in two opposite directions. Now, traditionally there have been societies of imbalance. One imbalance, one imbalance is a society that is completely immersed in pleasing itself. All, their whole concern is what? The body or the, the ruh? I won't even say soul. The body or the ruh? They, their concern becomes the body. How do you beautify it? How do you give it more luxury? How do you please it more? How do you give it more fame? Etc, etc, etc. And as, when this balance occurs and you're overfeeding one, what are you doing to the other? You're starving it and choking it. And you're killing it. And on the other hand, there was another extreme, for example, in the Christian tradition, especially the Catholic tradition, of monasticism. Right? And becoming monks. What you do is the body is evil. Its desires are evil. We're not going to get married. We're not going to wear comfortable clothes. We're, we're going to keep ourselves in pain. Right? This ha- even happened in Muslim tradition. Some of the ulama, they would wear, or I don't know if you'd call them ulama, but they would wear really uncomfortable clothes that would like, you know, like cause irritation on the skin. And they would say, this is because we don't want any pleasures of this dunya. I guess the heart was in the right place, but it was a little too far in the right place. <laughs> imbalance. Imbalance, right? These are two extreme imbalances. One directed completely towards the body, the other completely directed towards the soul. But Allah made us of two things. He made us of two things. Which means He expects from us to give justice to what? Two things. Which is why, while Allah talks about the obligations we have to our ruh, He also says, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ dunya." Don't forget your portion from where? This world, worldly life also. The obligations you owe in this world, and the, obliga- the rights that are owed to you, don't forget them either. So we're this composite of two things. We're this composite of two things. Now if I had a, like a chart, I'd give you a little bit of a diagram. I want to paint this picture because this is one of the most important places in the Qur'an where this picture should be painted. You know, at the center of the discussion of iman and kufr is the word qalb, heart. That's the word, that's the, at the center of this discussion in all of the Qur'an. And Allah says that the Qur'an is the location, and I'm, I'm talking about the Qur'anic version of human personality now, okay? That's why I'm bringing this up. At this, at this location, Allah mentions a few things. He mentions diseases, right? Diseases that are in the heart. So, فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ Right? That, that's mentioned also. In this heart, there are also mentioned desires, desires. Fears are mentioned here, love is mentioned here, right? Hate is mentioned here, anger is mentioned here, jealousy is mentioned here. So emotions are also mentioned associated with the heart. Diseases are mentioned with the heart, emotions are mentioned with the heart, faith is mentioned with the heart. Iman, وَزَيَّنَهُ fi qulubikum. He beautified iman in your hearts. When Allah mentions iman in kufr, and people refuse to believe, Allah says their hearts have become hard. ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ Hearts have become hard. So iman and kufr is inside the heart. Desires are inside the heart. Emotions are inside the heart. Diseases are inside. This is really the center. This is the center. Now what are the things that affect this heart? This heart has, you could say it has two influences. Two influences. One influence is from the needs of the body. And the other is the needs of what? The soul. Right? If it listens to the body the whole time, what happens to the heart? It becomes hard. If it listens to the soul the whole time, it is doing injustice to its body. There's another imbalance. There's another imbalance. Now, what influences 
you know, these two influences that are trying to win over this heart. The heart is the territory, and you have to share this authority, right? This is the castle you want to win over. And both of these sides are fighting inside of us, right? How do they both advertise to the heart? Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Nasam'a wal Basara wal Fuad. Hearing and listening, hear, hearing, listening, and seeing. And then he mentions the heart. So how does the message of the world, the bodily desires, how do they enter us? How do they reach us? Either we see what we desire or we hear about what we desire. And how does the, the needs of the ruh, how do they reach us? We see the truth and we hear the truth, right? So the, these two mediums are the ones by which the truth is coming to us. Also falsehood is coming to us. To us. Now, revelation is called light. Revelation is called light. Iman is also called light. There's a light inside of us, which is the fitrah that Allah created us with, and there's the light of revelation. When you hear the revelation, it's like, you know, even though it's hearing, the image is that of light entering inside of you. Revelation is light, so light has entered inside of you. And what's already inside, if you're a good person, your fitrah is still intact. Light is inside of you. So when these two lights come into contact, Surah An-Nur describes it, and it says, Nurun ala nur. Light upon light. The light of revelation and the light of goodness that's already inside of you, inside your heart. Right? These are the two lights that are meeting. Now, in describing this conflict, the word for the Qur'an is nafs. This conflict that we just talked about, the word that describes that conflict is the nafs. The nafs is being pulled in two directions. When it goes too far in one direction, it starts feeling bad. It starts feeling bad. So it becomes a nafs al-lawama, a blameworthy nafs, a guilty nafs. Then it pulls itself back and makes tawbah and istighfar and returns to a balance. And what does it become again? An nafs al mutma'inna, the tranquil conscience, the conscience at ease, the conscience at ease. But it doesn't. It never stays that way. It's constantly being pulled towards the direction of the body. Now, what are we? What are we exposed to more? The are we being? Are, is more of the desires of our body being advertised to us, or more the needs of our soul, our ruh, being provided to us? Obviously the body, the dunya is bombarding us constantly, right? So Allah mentions النفس الأمارة Okay? إِنَّ النفس الأمارة بالسوء No doubt the nafs, it commands to evil. The way Allah captures this, that in this surah, it's incredible. He says, فَأَلْهَمَهَا Then He placed inside the nafs. Put, it, some, put something inside its heart. Ilham is to put a feeling in your heart that is more certain than fact. You know in English literature, we call it a gut feeling. That's what that is. Ilham is a gut feeling. I just know that it's right. I just know we have to take a left, for sure. <laughs> you know how you're really, really sure sometimes? That's ilham. And this is a u- word used more generally than wahi. Wahi can be used for animals or human beings. Allah even uses it for the bee. Awha ila nahl. But ilham is only used for creatures of intellect when they become firm about something. And Allah is telling us that He puts something inside of us that is this ilham. This is a gift from Allah Azza wa Jal. What is this ilham? Fujuraha wa taqwaha. This is amazing. He says, Fujur. He gave it, he, he gave it a clear conscience, a clear understanding of its fujur. Fujur literally comes from fajr, which is to rip and tear open. It is used like a fajr is the one who rebels against Allah in the worst possible way. In the worst possible way. So fujur means the, the understanding of what is clearly rebellious to Allah. But Allah doesn't even say, فَأَلْهَمَهَا الْفُجُورَ He says, فُجُورَهَا The fujur of the rebellion, this excessive, this, this violent and completely obnoxious disregard of the nafs. Meaning Allah made the nafs aware that it has an evil inclination inside it. It has something inside it that has the capability of fujur. It's already pre-programmed inside that it has that potential. And Allah made it aware that that potential is there. And when it heads in that direction, there's this alarm system that goes off. You're headed in the wrong direction. That's the guilty conscience. That's the ilham that Allah is talking about. That when the human being does something wrong, even if they haven't studied revelation, even if they're Christian or Jewish or atheist or agnostic or whatever, when they're about to steal, something goes off inside. Something tells them this isn't right. And, something for, and they have to sh- shut themselves up, basically. They have to stop listening to themselves. You know, cartoonists used to do this. Right, cartoonists, they're depicting this guy's about to go kill somebody, and this, boom, and this guy comes up and says, don't do it. And the other guy comes up and says, just do it. <laughs> and one guy beats up the other guy and he does it. Tom and Jerry used to do this. 
right? But these are illustrations even in contemporary culture of the same concept. That Allah made the human being aware inside of himself that something is wrong. And you know why this is so important? Because for the Muslim, for the Muslim, when we know we're doing something wrong, the first place we find out we're doing something wrong is ourselves. And when we do it anyway, we feel uncomfortable. And when we feel uncomfortable, we go to the imam and say, is this really haram, this thing, if somebody does it? They don't say, I did it. What do you say? If somebody did that, is that really haram? And the imam says, yep, that's pretty much haram. Then you feel even more uncomfortable. So you go to somebody else and say, is this really haram? And they say, ah, there may be other opinions. And you feel a little better. Then you start googling it until you find somebody who tells you it's halal and your conscience is at ease. But your first fatwa was not given by somebody else. Where was it given? Your, your own. And that's why you went asking. You went asking around because you felt something inside. So this is fujuraha. And then what taqwaha. Allah gave, Allah Azza wa gave this human being, He inclined in him the ability or the, the consciousness, the awareness to protect itself. Taqwaha. Taqwa literally means protection and precaution. Actually, the, the root origin of the word is amazing. It is to, to, is to protect yourself from something bad so that you're staying away from the bad thing and from the punishment that will come as a result. So you're protecting yourself from two things, becoming bad and getting punished. That is taqwa, actually. And we constantly translate it as fear, but fear is an implication of taqwa, not taqwa itself. Fear is because you're afraid of doing something bad and you're afraid of getting punished, so you save yourself from it. But literally taqwa is protecting yourself. So Allah says, be inspired inside the human being, a, a recognition of evil, fujuraha, this evil rebellion against Allah. And by the way, fujur by necessity means rebellion against an authority. You're violating something that was already placed. So in the word fujur, we're already learning the nafs knows that there's an authority above. The guilty conscience in and of itself is a proof that there's a master, there's a lord. Because why would you feel bad anyway? You know, people, atheists and stuff, even they say, I feel bad. So even their conscience is telling them there's a master who can make you feel that way. Subhanallah. That's Qur'an psychology. And then, وَتَقْوَاهَا And the urge to protect itself. And to protect its nafs. And to keep that balance. Let's read something from a tafsir inshaAllah ta'ala. That is written by a shawkani rahimahullah. In regards to فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Before we take a break for the Maghrib prayer. What time is the Maghrib prayer by the way? 45. Oh 45? We got some time, okay. أي عرفها. So he says, فألهمها فجورها وتقواها. أي عرفها وأفهمها حالهما. He made the human being thoroughly aware, and he made him clearly recognize the two states, both of those states of of it. وما فيهما من الحسن والقبح. And he make, made the human being realize the beauty in taqwa and the ugliness in fujur. I mean, the ugliness in in rebelling against Allah and the beauty in protecting yourself. وَعَرَّفَهَا طَرِيقَ الْفُجُورِ Mujahid says, he made him realize the path of evil. Meaning it's the ultimate evil, but he made the human being realize, if I take this first step, it'll lead to a step worse and worse and worse, until I end up in the worst state. So you know how people say sometimes to ease their conscience, what I did wasn't that bad, at least I didn't kill anyone. Right? People say, make excuses like that, meaning in order to justify their bad behavior, they compare themselves to someone much worse. It's not like I robbed a bank or something. It's just riba, etc. Right? So what you do is you compare yourself to worse. But in your conscience, the fact that you said that, you know that this is leading to worse. Meaning you do something a little bit bad, and you let the crack open, and some comes through, and more is bound to happen, and the crack's gonna start getting bigger and bigger, until the dam is broken, and the flood waters come through. Subhanallah. This is why Allah protects the believers when He says, "Udhulu fi silmi kafatan," Enter into the fold of Islam, totally. Don't let any cracks... Because even a little bit of crack, what's going to happen over time? It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. This is the human being recognized this. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And finally we find Al-Farra' saying فَأَلْهَمَهُمَا oh, oh, Actually, yeah. فَأَلْهَمَهُمَا عَرَّفَهَا طَرِيقَ الْخَيْرِ وَطَرِيقَ الشَّرِ This is what I meant to say. That he made him realize the path of good and the path of evil. Allah did not say good and evil though. though it's, that's how it's been interpreted and we understand it that way. What he said was he made him realize its rebellion. It's worse disobedience and it's protection. And how to protect itself. So at the end of the day, it's not about good. Allah didn't say al-khayr wa shar. It's not about good and evil. What is it about? Protecting our own selves. This is the reality of the nafs. The nafs is not this benevolent creature that wants to do good beyond itself. Its first and foremost priority, its instinct is to benefit who? Itself. 
This is why Allah Azza wa Jalla let us know if you're the best of people even in ahsantum, even if you excel, ahsantum li anfusikum. You're only excelling for who? Yourselves. Yourselves. In modern ethics, there's this idea of I don't need a heaven and hell to tell me what's good and bad. I'm pretty good of, uh, in and of myself. I can do good things. You know, a, even an atheist and whatever can do good things and give in charity and all of that stuff. Why though? Why do they do that? Because in the end, who feels good? They themselves do. It's something for their own nafs that they do. It's something to, to ease their own conscience. Subhanallah. So now, in the previous surah, we found Allah gave us lots of abilities. Alam naj'al lahu aynain, wa shafatain. Right? Didn't we give him two eyes? Didn't we give him, you know, a tongue and, and two lips? Right? And now in this surah, we're learning if your nafs is in the right place, you will use the, those eyes for the right things. And you use your tongue and lip for those, the right things. But if that nafs is deviated and there's an imbalance, what's gonna happen? Those same gifts that Allah gave you are gonna be misused. And so when they're misused, you won't go the right way. In the previous surah, we found, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ najdain. We showed him, we guided him clearly to two pathways. And in this surah, a tafsir of that. What are those two pathways? Fujuraha wa taqwaha. Those, two, those are the two pathways. Either the rebellion against Allah or the protection. Yes? Oh, I thought it was 45. Okay, so inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll stop at this point and we'll take a break. And when we come back, we'll complete our study of Surah Al-Shams. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.